Segment 14A, Introduction. To this day, most people assume that the entire Roman Empire fell in 476 A.D. with a boy emperor named Romulus Augustulus, and that the Mediterranean world immediately descended into chaos afterward. The Western Emperor Romulus Augustulus did indeed step down in 476 A.D. I know this much is true. But most people forget that the Tetrarchy officially divided the West Empire into a Western, Latin-speaking half and an Eastern, Greek-speaking half. As we will see, ruling the entire Roman Empire was just barely possible, even for a strong emperor like Constantine the Great. For a weak emperor, it was downright impossible. And as luck have it, luck had it, the eastern half was far more coherent than the western half. Segment 14b, Rome as a Christian Empire, discusses the Christianization process of the Roman world, which was hardly the alleged blank check written by Constantine. In fact, the 313 A.D. Edict of Milan merely tolerated the Christian faith. It was better than what they had before. Although Constantine personally supported Christianity, and he founded his new capital at Constantinople as a Christian city, he himself did not become a Christian until just before his death in 337 A.D. The fact that all of Constantine's successors except for one, the pagan, Julian the Apostate, were Christians, spe sped up the process of Christianization. But paganism would not be made illegal for another half century, and the Christians very quickly began persecuting each other even more viciously than the pagans had persecuted them. In segment 14c, East versus West. The Roman Empire is split once and for all in 395 AD by the Emperor Theodosius. Although both of the sons Theodosius installed as emperors of East and of the West were nincompoops, there really wasn't much Theodosius could do to save the western half of the empire. The great barbarian invasions of the 5th century AD soon stripped the Western Empire of almost all its territory and resources. The only partially successful way to defend the West was with German mercenaries, and even that didn't work for long. On the other hand, the eastern half of the empire, the Greek-speaking half, had numerous advantages. These included Constantinople's choice location, its closeness to trade routes, a more highly urbanized society, and most importantly, the knack of diverting barbarian invasions away from them and towards the Western Empire. In segment 14D, fall of the Western Empire, the, Roman, the Western Roman Empire definitely falls, but when? The Germanic king Odo Vecar, whose name would really be a great name, I think, for a heavy metal rock band, Odo Vecar, um, deposed Romulus Augustulus in 476, and he ruled Italy as a subordinate of the Eastern Emperor Zeno. He claimed only the title King of Italy. The Ostrogoth king Theodoric, who displaced Odo Vecar, showed the same restraint and the same regard for the ancient Roman ways that Odo Vicar actually did. It's doubtful that the average Bubicus or Jethro living in the Western Roman Empire noticed any major difference. This changed, however, after the Eastern Emperor Justinian brutally reconquered Italy, erasing much of the Roman culture still left. What little culture infrastructure was be left behind was destroyed in the Lombard conquest of Italy, which started in 568 AD. The city of Rome became a shabby backwater full of crumbling buildings and starving masses. Only the bishops of Rome, the popes, kept the situation from getting worse, but the papacy was not yet a substitute for effective government. Eventually, the Western Empire would be revived, but not until 800 A.D. 
given the chaos ensuing after the Lombard invasion of Italy. 568 AD is my choice of logical ending date for the Western Empire. And if you don't like that, argue with me. Segment 14b, Rome as a Christian Empire. The crisis of the third century AD changed the Roman world for good, internally and externally. The crisis is said to have ended in 284 AD with the rise of Diocletian. Diocletian's solution was establishing the Dominate, a totalitarian state which extracted the maximum wealth from the economy to protect the Roman world's borders. Save for those closely connected to the Roman imperial family, life got tougher for everybody across the board. The old state religion of the Romans had changed into the emperor's cult of personality. Diocletian had been chosen by the gods, was a god himself, and if you didn't like that, you either kept your mouth shut or you got killed. Understandably, many people did not enjoy this sort of existence. With so many possible religions to choose from, none grew during the imperial crisis quite like Christianity did. The Christians regarded Rome's struggles as a sign of the end times and the second coming of Christ. Yet at the same time, Christians functioned well enough within the Roman Empire even despite the persecutions. In fact, the Christians were very often excellent Roman citizens. During the tough times of the crisis of the 3rd century AD, Christian communities often gave charity to fellow Christians who were down on their luck. Other religious belief groups had nothing similar to offer the Roman Empire's people, spiritually, intellectually, or socially. Up through the crisis of the 3rd century, the Roman government hardly noticed the Christian church, save for isolated outbursts of persecution. The Christians were not yet numerous enough to challenge Roman morals, Roman security, or anything else of the most maiorum. The Christians did not want to proselytize other Romans or convert them. They did not claim for their proper place in Roman society. More than anything else, they wanted to earn a living and to be left alone to worship in their own way. But as the second coming of Jesus Christ seemed less and less imminent, the Christian church too evolved into a permanent institution with its own bureaucracy. Rituals became officially established. Leaders emerged. Increasingly, individual Christians were compelled to play greater roles in public life, which required a balancing act between God and Caesar, if you will. There is never any doubt, though, that to the Christian mind, God came first. This bothered old-school Romans. As the Christian church became more entrenched, it drew more attention from the Roman government, always in favorable. The bigger the threat to Roman security and stability, especially during the crisis of the 3rd century AD, it seemed the more Christians were persecuted. Even after Diocletian effectively stabilized the empire, Christians were official scapegoats for whatever problems remained, and there were a lot of them. Elaborate loyalty tests were administered. Those Christians who would not burn incense before the emperor's statue or swear oaths against the Christian faith were executed. Not all, not all Christians held to their beliefs under such horrible circumstances, but most did. Moreover, the courage of those martyrs who wouldn't give in won even more converts, proof that the secular Roman Empire was just a phase, and that a human being's true reward existed only in the heavenly kingdom of God. Contrary to popular belief, the Emperor Constantine the Great, 306 to 337 AD, did not make Christianity the state religion of Rome. He was not even baptized a Christian until just before his death. 
Rather, it looks though as though Constantine became interested in Christianity as he crawled his way up from a wannabe tetrarch to sole ruler of the Roman world. In 312 AD, Constantine and his troops stood at the Milvian Bridge just outside Rome, preparing to attack the army of his bitter rival, Maxentius. The chances of his success weren't good. As tradition has it, Constantine saw a vision of the Labarum, the Cairo monogram of Christ, and heard the Greek words, in neka, in this sign, conquer. And history tells us that Constantine won despite stiff odds. This victory at the Milvian Bridge made Constantine the ruler of the Western Roman Empire. In 313, Constantine and his eastern counterpart Licinius issued the Edict of Milan. This famous decree made Christianity one of the empire's officially tolerated religions, and it officially permitted Christians to serve in public life. After Licinius broke with Constantine and fought against Constantine for control of the empire, he, Licinius that is, resumed persecuting Christians. Constantine's defeat of Licinius in 324 established him permanently as sole ruler of the Roman world. In turn, Constantine established Christianity once and for all as a legitimate Roman religion, with his official personal blessing as sole emperor. As sole emperor, Constantine reserved the right to get involved in church matters such as the Arian controversy. At the Synod of Nicaea in 325, even though he wasn't baptized himself, Constantine compelled the Christian bishops to select the so-called orthodox view that God the Father and Christ the Son were of exactly the same substance. This was against the so-called Arian view that God the Father and Christ the Son were merely of quote-unquote similar substance. In Constantine's defense, though, Christian theological disputes often threatened the peace of the empire, especially when they led to rioting, and especially over matters that we would consider, well, not worth dying over. But the streets of the Eastern Empire's great cities were choked by Christians brawling to the death over whether Christ the Son was of the same substance as God the Father or whether he was merely similar. Obviously, the Christians could persecute each other even worse than the pagans did. When Constantine founded his second Rome on the former site of Byzantium in 330 B.C., the city known as Constantinople or Istanbul or Constantinople was intended as a Christian community. Although Christianity was still not the empire's only official religion, Constantine likely saw it moving in that direction. Baptized at last upon his deathbed in 337 AD, Constantine left the empire to his three sons. In the best Roman tradition, they fought amongst each other until only one, Constantius II, ruled 337 to 361 AD, survived. Being of the Arian persuasion himself, Constantius fought hard against the orthodox view his father had adopted at Nicaea in 325. Constantius II was challenged and eventually succeeded by his nephew Julian, ruled 361 to 363 AD, better known as Julian the Apostate. All this time, Julian had merely pretended to be Christian in order to preserve his life. Once emperor, he tried to bring back that good old-time Greco-Roman religion, slathered with a healthy dose of Neoplatonic funkiness or Flava. Julian had hoped to eclipse the Christian religion, but in fact the pagan religion he advocated was all but dead itself. 
Julian's invasion of Persia fared no better. Like many of his predecessors, Julian saw the need for a preemptive strike on Persia. He had also become convinced that he really was the reincarnation of Alexander the Great. But after Julian was killed in battle in 363 AD, the Roman Empire would be ruled only by Christians. Segment 14c, East versus West. The last Roman emperor to rule the whole empire was Theodosius I, 379 to 395 AD, who came to power just after Rome's first great battle with the Goths. The Gothic tribes had been driven out of modern-day Ukraine by an eastern people called the Huns. The Goths hoped the Romans would let them settle on Roman land south of the Danube. The Emperor Valens agreed. Hoping to add to Roman tax receipts and enlarge the Roman Empire, he admitted more Goths into the Roman Empire than the land could actually support. A great famine resulted, followed by a Gothic revolt in 377. The next year, the Goths handed the Romans a terrific whipping at the Battle of Adrianople and ran right all through the Balkans. The new emperor, Theodosius, could not beat the Goths in the field, so he bought them off with a treaty. The Goths received land in modern-day Bulgaria and were enrolled into the Roman army as foiderati, or federated troops. Although the Goths lived within Rome's borders and defended these borders, they were not allowed to think of themselves as Romans, and this was a bad career move. Somehow Theodosius held the barbarians in check as long as he lived, and he earned for this the name the Great. But he could not produce, sadly, a worthy successor. The eastern half of the Roman Empire went to Theodosius's 18-year-old son, Arcadius, 395 to 408 AD. And the western half went to his 10-year-old son, Honorius, 395 to 423 AD. Although they were to coordinate their efforts, as Diocletian had hoped to do with the Tetrarchy a century earlier, this time the empire's break into eastern and western halves was permanent. In a way, this was nearly inevitable. The Romans had conquered and brought order to the entire Mediterranean world. The Hellenistic peoples of the east had accepted Roman civilization, and the ex-barbarians of the west had adopted Roman civilization. The Roman achievement was so amazing that one might assume that it would continue this way forever, which, of course, it doesn't. It never does. The Romans had held both halves of the empire together for three major reasons. First, the Romans' willingness to embrace Greek culture had made it easy to rule the Greek-speaking peoples of, Rome's east, of the empire's eastern half. Two, Augustus' success at fixing the dead Roman Republic and balancing civilian and military power had made the Pax Romana possible. Third, the Romans were just plain lucky. Lucky that no evil empire or marauding barbarians had been knocking down Rome's doors, or to be more precise, Rome's limes. But by Theodosius' death, the Greek and Roman cultures had fused as much as they were going to fuse, and now they were starting to split along religious lines. The Pax Romana now existed only in fits and starts. Finally, the Roman world was beset by dangerous enemies on almost all sides. Neither Arcadius nor Honorius was cut out to rule half of the Roman Empire. Honorius, indeed, was said to be such a dim bulb that Roma, to him, meant only the name of his pet chicken. Rome had come down quite a bit in other ways, too. It had become, more or less, a provincial backwater 
thanks to its distance from the military flashpoints of the Western Empire. Beginning in 402 AD, Honorius would rule the Western Empire from Ravenna in Italy's far northwest, an isolated garrison town surrounded by marshes and far closer to the Danube and Rhine frontiers. Arcadius, meanwhile, ruled from the growing city of Constantinople, already a military center and fast becoming the cultural center of the Eastern Empire. Both Arcadius and Honorius left the real work of running the empire to German generals and or trusted confidants. Each was succeeded by a rash of puppet emperors who were controlled by more of the usual generals and trusted confidants. In 476 AD, the West ran out of puppet emperors with one Romulus Augustulus. The Eastern Empire would continue and sometimes even thrive mightily for another millennium. There is no one reason why the Western Roman Empire collapsed, but several contributing factors are clear. The most important factor is, of course, the numerous barbarian invasions. In 407, the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes conquered Britain. In 410, the Visigoths, last seen on the south banks of the Danube, sacked Rome. In 411, the Vandals showed up in Spain and soon spread into northern Africa. In 451, Attila the Hun invaded Italy but stopped short of sacking Rome. In 455, the Vandals came in and captured Rome yet again. I think you get the picture. The skyrocketing costs of running a huge military and a huge bureaucracy required more income than Rome could provide. The intermittent sacking of Rome certainly hurt the imperial morale, not to mention the Romans themselves. But the Vandals' control of Gaul, Spain, and Africa effectively cut the Western Empire off from its most valuable territories. As upper classes will do, the Western elite did their best to dodge taxes. The brunt of the taxes fell upon the impoverished peasantry, who had hardly any food, much less money. When farmers fled to the shelter of wealthy landlords who could, pop, could protect them, the, le the result was even lower farm production and acute manpower shortages. Another result was feudalism. What little money the Western Empire had went to bribe the less dangerous Germanic tribes to defend the Western Empire from the more dangerous Germanic tribes. When the Vandals marched on Rome in 455 BC, the city was powerless to resist. Fortunately, they did not live up to their glorious name, and the Western Empire was allowed to limp on but not for much longer. The Eastern Roman Empire remained strong. Constantinople was built on a site controlling the strategically important Bosphorus, separating Europe from Asia. The Eastern emperors were often able to steer migrating barbarians, such as the Goths and the Vandals, past their own land and straight into the Western Empire. The Eastern Empire's share of the Lemix, or boundary space, was mostly Egyptian and Syrian desert, as opposed to the miles upon miles of heavily populated Danube and Rhine valleys defended by the Western Empire. The Eastern part of the Empire was also more urbanized and more heavily populated, with a much stronger economic base. Ancient Egypt provided mountains of grain, and the East's free peasant farmers were far more numerous than their semi-enslaved Western counterparts. What manufacturing occurred in the empire took place in the East, and the East was also the place where the profitable trade from Arabia, India, and China was controlled. The patriarchs of the Christian church in the Eastern Empire 
basically accepted the political and spiritual authority of the emperor in Constantinople. This was far less complicated than the Western tem emperor's tendency to obey the Bishop of Rome, or Pope, on major issues. Indeed, this division between Western, or Catholic, and Eastern, or Orthodox, Christianity would parallel the physical division between the Western and Eastern empires. Segment 14D, Fall of the Western Empire. On the death of Theodosius the Great in 395 AD, the Roman Empire was divided for good into its eastern and western halves. The Eastern Empire benefited from fairly stable leadership to go along with its other military and economic advantages. But the Western Empire staggered on under the leadership of German generals and Roman puppet emperors. In 475 AD, the Western Emperor Julius Nepos made the mistake of letting the German general Orestes command his armies. Before year's end, Orestes, a former associate of Attila the Hun, had rebelled against Nepos and drove him out of his capital at Ravenna. Because, as a German, Orestes was not considered imperial material, Orestes crowned a puppet emperor, his own son, Romulus Augustulus. This arrangement lasted one year. In 476, the mercenary general Otto Vicar declared himself king of Italy, killed Orestes, and packed little Romulus Augustulus off for good. Realizing that he lacked the status to become emperor, Otto Vicar returned the imperial regalia and crowns and whatnot back to the eastern emperor Zeno at Constantinople. In return, Zeno confirmed Otto Vicar as king of Italy. So ended the Roman Empire in the West, according at least to Enlightenment historians like Edward Gibbon. The common people of the Western Empire probably didn't even notice. In Northern Africa, the Vandals had established their kingdom. The Visigoths ruled most of Spain along with southwestern France. Western France was divided among the Burgundians to the south and the Franks to the north. Other nations holding on to parts and pieces of the Western Empire included the Bretons, the Britons, the Anglo-Saxons, Ostrogoths, Gepids, Picts, and Scots. Babacus and Jethro still had taxes to pay and bureaucrats to obey too. It's just that the paying or and being was done to a Visigoth king or a Vandal king or a Frankish king as opposed to a figurehead Roman emperor. Otto Vicar himself preserved all the features of the old Roman government, even including the Roman Senate and the rule of Roman law. As a result, he was much appreciated by the people of Rome and all Italy. And when Otto Vicar began to dream of something more than being king of Italy, he was supported by these people. But Otto Vicar's dreams of being more than just king of Italy bothered the Eastern Emperor Zeno. Trying to kill two birds with one stone, Zeno prompted the neighboring Ostrogoth king Theodoric to attack Otto in 493 AD. Though not a Roman himself, Theodoric had lived for a long time in Constantinople and he had held high posts in the Roman army. Zeno wanted to get Theodoric and those Ostrogoths as far away from his empire as he could. And after successfully deposing Otto Vicar, Theodoric showed the same respect for Roman culture, letting even pagan Romans live as they pleased. Unfortunately, Theodoric died in 526 AD without a strong successor leaving behind, predictably, the usual confusion. Within a decade, the Eastern Emperor Justinian 
527 to 565 AD had invaded Italy and took it back. The last of the tr truly Roman empires to rule the east, Justinian wanted to re reacquire the entire Roman Empire. When he conquered Vandal, North Africa, he regarded it as a promising sign. Even though Justinian did succeed in taking Italy from the Ostrogoths, the war was long and bloody and helped stamp out most of the existing Roman culture. In 568 AD, a fierce German tribe known as the Lombards invaded and shortly retook all of Italy, save for Ravenna and its surrounding area. Italy became a patchwork of Lombard dukedoms or duchies with little or in, if any residual Roman culture, save for the Latin language. If you could still call it Latin. Now the rest of the old Roman Empire really did belong to barbarians. Indeed, I consider the year 568 AD a more logical ending date for the Western Roman Empire, far more so than the departure of sad little Romulus Augustulus in 476. Although the city of Rome was near now but a shadow of itself physically and culturally, it was still very heavily populated. The masses had to look somewhere for leadership and material assistance. This was provided by the bishops of Rome, also known as popes. In the Western Empire, the w bishops of Western, or the Catholic Church, tended to consider themselves equal to the emperors, and the bishop of Rome was considered, as the pope, to be the prince of Catholic bishops. As such, the Roman bishops had a great deal of wealth to use, which they used to le fill the void in social services left by the emperors. With the end of the Western Empire, the Catholic Church gained even more clout. The Bishop of Rome was influential not only at home, but all over the Western Empire. In recognition of this fact, the Pope Gregory I, 590 through 604 AD, adopted the old Roman title Pontifex Maximus and started sending ambassadors to the Western countries. Although Gregory's relationships with the Eastern Orthodox patriarchs were polite enough, Gregory's papacy, or popehood, marked the beginning of the Roman Church's quest for world domination. In the Eastern Empire, the patriarchs of the great cities competed against each other for influence and imperial favor, thereby weakening their individual status. In the West, though, the Bishop of Rome alone determined the correct belief then and now. The Pope's ability to control kings and nobles would have been unthinkable in the East, where emperors knew how to keep their patriarchs in line. And this difference approach only deepened the division between the Western Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. The Lombard rulers of Italy had understandably little affection for the ambitious bishops of Rome. But the popes could count on strong defenders in the Frankish kings of northwestern France. The greatest of Frankish kings, Charlemagne, 768 to 814 AD was himself a devout Catholic believer, always willing to help the Pope when needed. Once Charlemagne had con conquered enough territory to call himself Imperator, Pope Leo III crowned him as Imperator on Christmas Day, 800. Whether the ceremony was Charlemagne's own idea is open to question. Like his predecessors, Pope Leo III wanted to boost the Western Church's influence, so it suited him to have a Western Emperor to balance the Eastern Emperor. And if the Western Emperor received his crown from the Pope personally, so much the better. Whether the ceremony was Charlemagne's idea or whether it was Pope Leo III's, 
the so-called Holy Roman Empire had begun. As Emperor of the West, Charlemagne declared himself the successor of Romulus Augustulus and claimed equality with Empress Irene of Byzantium. The Holy Roman Empire would change many times over the century. As some wags have put it, it was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Yet in the hearts of its rulers, it always remained a Christianized continuation of the state founded by Romulus and Remus on the morning of April 23rd, 753 B.C. Segment 14E, Conclusions. 1. Christianizing the Empire. Christianizing the Roman world was a process and not done by imperial directive. Constantine started this process, although he never did make Christianity the religion of the Roman state. He didn't even convert to Christianity until just before his death. The Christian church first attracted imperial notice in the second century AD. As waiting for the second coming became less important than preparing the Christian church and its people for when the second coming did occur. The Christian church's focus on the heavy, heavenly life to come rather than on the earthly secular life won it many followers, as did its social outreach to those less fortunate. When Constantine did give Christianity the status of an officially approved religion, he did not persecute pagans, nor did the Christians persecute pagans at first. Instead, they were more concerned with persecuting other Christians over issues we would now consider trivial. The fact that almost all of Constantine's successors were Christians increased the Christian church's prestige and power. Yet, paganism flourished in Rome itself well into the 6th century after Christ. 2. Those Dirty Barbarians they came from the east, sometimes from as far as Asia. The first wave was primarily Germanic tribes, such as the various Goth tribes, Visigoths and Ostrogoths, who had basically, basically grown too large to live comfortably within their traditional homelands. The Goths had wanted to settle within the boundaries of Rome and to become Romans. But for whatever reason, the Romans were not willing to permit this. By the time Theodosius I was ready to try assimilating the Goths, there were literally too many Germans knocking at Rome's figurative front door. Visigoths, Vandals, Swabi, and even the Alans took turns at pillaging the Western Empire, sometimes even sacking Rome. Worst of all, were the Asiatic Huns. They were led by a former protege of the Eastern Emperor known as Attila T. Hun. The T stands for the. Having been turned away by the Persian Empire and then encouraged to go farther west by the Eastern Roman Empire, the Huns drove the Visigoths out of their native lands. And once the Visigoths had passed within the boundaries of the empire, the Huns turned to Constantinople and then Ravenna. He may even have left his business card. He chose not to pursue the matter further and died a year afterward. Though Attila the Hun himself was no more, Rome's problems continued. 3. The Eastern Empire had all the advantages. Part of the Eastern adv Empire's advantage was just plain luck. Constantinople had the advantage of an easily defended site on a peninsula overlooking where e Europe and Asia met. It had also been built or rebuilt on a grand scale for the express purpose of rivaling Rome. The Western Empire's capital, on the other hand, had to be moved from Rome to Ravenna because Rome was too far away from the military flashpoints on the frontier. Ravenna could not compare with Constantinople either as a capital or a military base, and the West suffered for it. 
the East as a whole was more urbanized than the West, which gave it an advantage in rounding up and distributing men, money, and materials. But part of it was just plain luck. For whatever reason, the barbarians who raided the empire preferred striking at the agricultural western half of the empire than at the urbanized eastern half of the empire. Four. When did the Western Empire fall? The influential historian Edward Gibbon, a favorite of our nation's founders, believed that the Western Empire fell in 476 AD with the departure of Romulus Augustulus and the accession of King Odo Vacar of Italy. It's doubtful that anybody outside of the royal courts noticed any difference. Same taxes, same local bureaucracies, same money. When Theodoric and his Ostrogoths defeated Odo Vicar in 493 AD, life again went on pretty much as usual, except for that neither Odo Vicar nor Theodoric ever claimed to be the Western Emperor. They were only king of Italy. Both kings respected the old Roman culture as did the Eastern Emperor Justinian, who had reconquered Italy and North Africa by 540 AD. Of course, Justinian destroyed much of in Italy's re surviving infrastructure in doing this, but at least he was a genuine emperor who spoke Latin. I myself, as I've said before, would pick 568 AD, which marked the beginning of the Lombard invasion of Italy because under the Lombards, Italy would very soon come to bear little, if any, resemblance to the great city founded at 8 o'clock on the morning of Thursday, April 21st, 753 B.C.